Has there been like any events that has, have happened in the world and you've thought, hey, that's actually really interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that and apply it to what I do in health and safety here for, for me and my job. Now, what I think Lego have done phenomenally well as a product is provide the ability of creativity without being creative. You can build something, you are given every single step. It's designed for you. The bricks are made for you. The instructions are given and all you, all you do is follow someone else's instructions. Yet at the end of it, you still feel like you've created something amazing. And people don't go, look at this product I bought from Lego. They go, look at this thing I built. Without wanting to sound as deep as a paddling pool for a second here, I've, <laughs> I've got very little imagination at times. I can, you tell me, can I create an abstract network of an interconnected management system for digitization? Oh my God, yeah, literally that comes to mind immediately. <laughs> if you tell me, Pete, how can we use Lego to improve understanding of risk assessment subjectivity? And I'm just like, um, um let me come back to you. All right, let, let's take five. Yeah. But if you did see it for the first time, you'd be like, oh my God. But the value we got out of that, we saw in that area, in instant improvement in fire door management and instant improvement in communal space management. They don't do that training course anymore because of health and safety. When we think about safety as being a traditionally really boring, kind of like maybe a stiff collar type of thing, a lot of people, mm. despite kind of the circles that we sit in, where actually safety is a bit more progressive, actually for, for a lot of businesses, safety is still fairly cookie cutter. A lot of paperwork, a couple of toolbox talks with someone just standing in front of you, maybe giving out a couple of slides and stuff. That's kind of it. That is that is that is be all and end all the safety. But I know that obviously we're talking here about gamification, the engagement and creativity that comes with board games that can be used to share a message. I love that, but I don't think that's the norm just yet, James. And I think it's amazing that we're able to try out this type of stuff. Good morning, Peter. Welcome back to the show. It's been actually ages since we've been on the podcast. It really has. We said about doing this 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 topic that we were going to talk about today ages ago, and I've completely forgot everything that I was going to bring up. So. Don't worry, James. I've, dare I say, I've got some notes. Uh, so that doesn't Kel surprise Surprise. Me. Kel surprise, right? So wanted to have a chat about inspiration, right? What inspires us in safety, but not necessarily the bog standard stuff, not necessarily the podcast, not necessarily the books, right? So James, I've seen something on your wrist this morning that is quite new. Now, for those of you obviously who aren't watching this on YouTube, you can't see this, but James has got a new watch, right? It's a smart watch. So James, you mentioned a little bit before, uh, what are you using it for? Uh, my primary aim uh, for this is, well, twofold. One is sleep monitoring so that I can be data informed. And two is to reduce me going on my phone. So I can get a notification and just look, is it anything important? No, it's not. Don't get my phone out. Because what I, what I was finding is I get a notification. I just double check what it is in case it's you know a customer or employee or family or whatever. And I'm like, no, no, it's nothing important. It's just Discord or whatever. And then yeah. I find myself... I'm on LinkedIn then, then I go from LinkedIn to Instagram, then I'm on YouTube, and then I'm just like two hours. It is a slippery that. slope, is that? Yeah. So, so those two things are my main drivers. Right. So my question for you, right, James, now, without wanting to divulge how old we are at the moment, right, I think both, it's fair to say, both of us grew up on Star Trek. Yes. Well, right, I now. was more Star Wars than I was Star <gasps> Trek. I probably only oh. recently got into Star Trek. Oh my uh, God, James, uh, no way, right? So me, coming back from school, six o'clock, The Simpsons from six until half six on BBC Two, followed <laughs> by Star Trek, The Next Generation, right? And genuinely, right. growing up, there were two things that I absolutely loved seeing in Star Trek, right? The first one, The Replicator. Jean-Luc Picard walking into his uh, captain's quarters and being like, tea, hot, Earl Grey. Yeah. I'm like, yes. That is it, yeah. right? And then the second one was actually the uh, device that the medics used. That was like the handheld one that would literally just scan you and it would tell you everything that's wrong. And I kind of thought, oh my God. Or something. Yeah, exactly. Literally, exactly that, right? And now, genuinely, the stuff of prospectively science fiction, right, back in what the, nine, like the 90s, is pretty much yeah. a reality to some degree now. You've literally got, I don't yeah. know about your, your watch, James, but like it tells you your sleep pattern. Does it tell you your heart rate? Yep. You can get one Which sound really tell you your, your O2 sats type of stuff. Literally, they can tell you if you are having a 
effectively a heart attack, right? Yeah. And it's genuinely, you're wearing it on your wrist. Absolutely incredible. We don't quite have something that you can shout at and it will materialize uh, Earl Grey tea out of thin air, but we've got 3D printers. These 3D printers can create food. You can literally create a burger from a 3D printer. You can create houses. You can literally build anything. People build weapons from 3D yeah. printing plastic parts and metal parts now. Yeah. It's honestly unreal. And it is genuinely massively inspiring to think, oh my God, how has science fiction turned into science fact? And well, I'll be honest with you, James, where, where are we seeing this for safety? That's what I want to know. Arthur C. Clarke said it, didn't he? Science fiction is but a precursor for, for, for fact or future or something like that. Um, and he's what one of the most pop, like biggest science fiction authors, I think. Yeah. But I mostly got that tagline from Thor. Um, oh, really? Third Thor film, where yeah, they were talking about like because obviously Th Thor is like myth, but then it's mm. real. And then in the film, they're like, but this is yeah. bullshit. And he said, Arthur C. Clarke, science fiction is a precursor for fact. And they're like, yeah. oh, for God's sake. Um, and that's, that's kind of what they've got. And then and I was, as you were saying that, I was like, well, that that's kind of what we're talking about here. Like, granted, Back to okay. the Future kind of got it a little bit wrong. They're supposed to have hoverboards by now. Kind of don't. A little bit disappointed by that, if I'm honest. Um, but, you know, some of the shit that we have now, like... Um, yeah. Like, do, do you? <laughs> I always use. I'm really bad at maths, right? And many other things, but maths is I really struggle with. Um, I pretty much self diagnose myself with like discalculus or whatever, but everyone diagnoses themselves with something nowadays. But I, um, I, I just, I can't do, I can't do, like, I can't do basic like times tables. I could just about get to about 12 on my threes. I can do my fives, that's about it, my twos tens that's it or elevens because they're really easy like i can do that anything else can't do can't do i can't do like just adding them subtracting easy like i'd have to use my feet so when i go to the gym and they're like oh, i just put like 60 kilos on the bar one i can't lift 60 kilos so that's a, we're off to a bad start uh, but two i'm standing there being like right the bar is 20 and then i've got a 10 on that side and a 10 on that side and everyone else just like boom 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 and i'm just like i can't do it and I remember my like to my teacher at school, I'd always just use a calculator. She was like, You're not gonna have a calculator in your pocket all the time. Well, yeah, I've got the world in my pocket now. Like I yeah. literally pick up my phone and I find out anything. So right. the first thing I, I would it. probably think of is just the the access to information that's mm. so readily available. Yeah. I think has changed the safety profession. Oh, massively. Like, there's older. there's a whole thing. There's that whole thing where it's it's now less about what you know and more about do you know where to look and do you know how to critically analyze the information that you find? Because as much as the internet is a beautiful place as a repository of information, oh my God, there's a lot of crap out there. Oh my God. And I know that we've kind of covered this before when we're talking about really important skills for safety professionals, but critical thinking has to be up there these days it really does because we're, we're not in, with the rise for example of chat gpt ai all of that kind of i'm going to call it a world of content created for you your ability as the prompter or the prompt writer or the searcher has to be tip top when it comes down to analyzing and critically analyzing the data that you find otherwise you're stuffed absolutely stuffed I do wonder though whether we lack imagination with a lot of this stuff. So, like... so on, on that bit, right? On, on imagination, what, what has there been like any events that has have happened in the world, and you've thought, "Hey, that's actually really interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that and apply it to what I do in health and safety here for for me and my job." Like, is there anything, any like real world event that you've kind of you? I want to say had the imagination to apply it to what you do but just something that you've kind of seen and then you've taken and you've applied it that's been totally not to do with safety. Um, yeah, but it's probably not like a serious event or anything. I've, I've taken quite a lot of like child games and board games and stuff and apply them. Okay. Talk me through it. Um, Talk me through it. So my, the first time I, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see, you see this little wooden thing here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a that's a board like it's a wooden board that a friend of mine um had like a laser cutter printer thing so you basically just put sheets of wood in and it will cut and do anything you want out of it basically mm. within reason so that is the first iteration of a fire evacuation board game that I made. Oh, um, no way. Yeah, yeah, which has evolved now, and it will be something in the future. And I'm not going to mention too much detail around what that is, but that's now changed and taken inspiration from a different type of board game. But, um, but yeah, I had this idea, and then I went around his house, and he like printed it out for me. And there's oh like a load God. of bits that come off it, and it's it's huge. But it all stemmed from, in when I worked in the NHS, we really struggled to do evacuation. So I, we were like the landlord of the building and our customers mm. were the trusts in the building and they couldn't just evacuate, you know, Sheila who's in a bed and just had a hip replacement or whatever. So we were like, well, how do we do it? And the way that the NHS or medical organizations have done it for a long time would be they would put like nurses or matrons or hcas in the bed and they would time the evacuation uh, from the furthest point and then they would basically make a calculation basically like a, a mathematical assumption um but it, it didn't it didn't add for verity or dynamic mm. nature of like things going wrong and stuff like that so um i just turned it into a board game and utilize the role of the dice to to implement like Verity, like variety, sorry, and and things going wrong. Oh um, God. And that then I that was really cool. Yeah, so we're now. Uh, I now got uh, approval from a current customer that we have now um, to yeah. test out version two point uh, oh, on uh, on his site. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to that. But I'll run you through that off off air. Um, oh my but... God. Right, Jake. Just, just. I just want to say, right, if your a uh, dice tower isn't like a fire station's training tower, I'll be very disappointed. <laughs> I, 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 I pitched it to them, and they were like, "Oh my God, if this sounds amazing, we want to do it." And I was like, "Cool." And they were like, "If this works, you could. You realize you could sell it with like your own branded dice." And I was like, "Don't, don't like that." Don't I would tease me like that. Freak out um oh, but, but yeah so like i've used a lot of games so as you know when we do like learning teams hacker fight like jenga is a really popular game that i think a lot of people use yeah. um but we use jenga buckaroo monkeys in a tower uh, lego lots of lego um loads of shit um but i take most of my inspiration of gamification and stuff like that i love that absolutely love that especially when we think about safety as being a traditionally really boring, kind of like maybe a stiff collar type of thing, a lot of people, despite kind of the circles that we sit in, where actually safety is a bit more progressive, actually for, for a lot of businesses, safety is still fairly cookie cutter. You know, it's mm. kind of just a lot of paperwork, a couple of toolbox talks with someone just standing in front of you, maybe giving out a couple of slides and stuff. And that's that's kind of it. That That is that is be all and end all the safety. but. And I know that obviously we're talking here about gamification, the engagement and creativity that comes with board games that can be used to share a message. I love that, but I don't think that's the norm just yet, James. And I think it's amazing that we're able to try out this type of stuff. I, I, mm. I really do. I mean, on, on that it topic It's difficult of games, though, isn't it? Oh, go on, you go. Oh yeah, no, no, I was gonna say just on, on that topic of games for a second, there was one, I'm a massive video gamer. Right, um, some might say that I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes down to video games. I've pretty much been playing them my entire life. Now, there is a really popular game called World of Warcraft. And I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of World of Warcraft. Good Great game. So for those of you who, who haven't, um, it's basically what's called an MMORPG. So a massive multiplayer online role-playing game. The idea being that you create your character, you level it up doing various activities, raids, dungeon trials, and all this and that type of stuff. And you kind of live in this world type of stuff. Back in 2005, James, I don't know if you heard about this. Did you hear about the corrupted blood incident? No. Right, so this, this is like nearly 20 years old, right, at this point, which is A, a bit scary to think about, but B, <laughs> a bit of a precursor to what we saw in 2019. So the idea was, is that uh, there was a dungeon with a particular boss that would infect certain players with a virus. And what some players realized is that their pets would get infected by this virus as well. But if they put the pets back in the inventory so they weren't out in the world, 
and then relaunch their pets outside of this kind of dungeon, the effect of the virus would then spread everywhere that that pet had come out. So if you imagine, James, that you've got a uh, an infection that's transmissible from an animal to a person that has been released in a heavily populated area where people have no immunity to a particular disease and it infects from one person to another very quickly and there's yeah. nothing that you can do to protect yourselves against it. Does that sound very familiar? No, I chance? never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> right. 2005, this happened in. And literally, That's it funny. decimated cities. We're talking like hundreds of thousands of players in this video game affected by it, right? To the extent oh that the administrators of the game had to literally reset entire parts of the map to stop this from happening. Because what they realized as well is... Literally that when, predicted a pandemic. Right, genuinely, genuinely. And when, when they took out the pets, what would happen in some cases is that like shopkeepers would get infected. But because of the rules of the game, the shopkeepers were immortal, so they couldn't die, but they still could be infected. So if you imagine you've kind of got this shopkeeper that's infected, but you don't realize it, and you as a free player are like, oh my God, I've escaped this, I've not seen any other player, and you go to the shopkeeper... The shopkeeper's infected, they can't die, and now they're literally reinfecting every single person oh that comes God. to see them. Right? It's that honestly it's fucking mad. 2005. When when I was in university in what well, this would have been 2011 or 2012, I think it was, I did a module in my environmental health degree on epidemiology and demography. <laughs> And I, I used this corrupted blood uh, incident as an example of uh what do you call it simulations uh, effectively in the real world because you get like don't get me wrong you get a load of really good simulations these days that come out right genuinely computing power in 2024 is unreal mm. but actually what simulations can't always be best at is predicting human behavior because we as humans are pretty unpredictable at times so there was a, a case where i think it was one of uh, it was a football game that was closed to the public right, very shortly before it was due to start. And the kind of the managers of the stadium thought, right, well, everyone will just disperse. But actually people didn't disperse. People actually crowded together outside of the stadium to continue watching the game on like, handheld devices. <laughs> so actually they didn't disperse. They didn't solve the problem. They just moved the problem elsewhere instead. And mm -hmm. people were still getting infected around the time of COVID because of all of these people bunching together. And actually what, we can see from this world of warcraft experience was what actually what do people really do and don't get me wrong yeah it's not like it's not me, like me physically in the world doing it it's my my avatar that's doing it type of stuff but it's still a bit of a, a reflection on what human behavior could be like mm. so again 2005 as an amazing probably one of the only times it would ever happen experiences of a natural pandemic happening within a video game to affect hundreds of thousands of people at the same time that's loads of know. stuff to learn from that loads that's of stuff even know. now wow wow i didn't know that i'm totally gonna check that out that's unbelievable it honestly it's kind of blow my mind a little bit but you could have you could have sent like you could, the problem is you'd get laughed out of the world, wouldn't you? But imagine if, yeah. like, Bojo was like, well, we're actually consulting um, the previous CEO or the current CEO of World of Warcraft because they've been through this. Everyone would yeah. be like, what the fuck are you doing? But, like, they genuinely have. Like, you've got everything there, right? You've got you've got infrastructure in the get. Granted, mm. it's based in, like, medieval fantasy world. But if you put that to one side, you've got infrastructure. You've got critical services, e.g., your NPCs that have to mm. carry on. So you've got you've got critical services continuing on. You've got yeah. the chaotic nature of just humans because it's actual humans playing the game. So people yeah. just ignoring it and carrying on. People that are just so worried they're going to lose all their freaking hard earned loot or whatever that they just hide their character out of the way. You have got people that I don't know purposely spread it whatever bad actors you, yeah you're, you've got all of this shit going on which is ju just human nature because we're all just weird but probably exacerbated because everyone's kind of safe because it's in a game so a little bit exacerbated maybe but ultimately if it 
exaggeration is is a good mm. thing you know yeah. if it's exaggerated then we can then we can learn something from that exaggeration but Absolutely. the problem is can you imagine a social media outcry like if bojo went or any you know like the international health organization was like well we're currently considering we're currently consulting with world of warcraft team to learn from their yeah. experience of when they had a pandemic in the in the game i mean yeah. I, I don't know if I don't know how I would react. I think maybe part of me would laugh at them, but like as a member of the public, I'd think they're an absolute bloody idiots. It's a video game, right? If I was yeah. just a bog standard member of the public, I'd think that is wild. But knowing a bit about it, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a huge yeah. amount of sense. Huge amount of sense. So it's so interesting because we like sometimes I've not all the time. Most most of the time when we like pull the games out in workshops, well, like hmm. bear in mind like. We're doing workshops and learning teams and hackathons, whatever you want to call them nowadays, with like typically like working adults. Like they're always like full grown adults, mix of like shop floor engineers to like corporate heads of directors of, of big companies and small companies. And then James is standing at the front and whips out a couple of baggies of Lego and it's just like, right. I want you to do something with Lego. Like you genuinely do sometimes just get like, oh, fuck off, what am I doing here? Yeah. Um, and then it's even worse when you whip out like monkeys in a barrel or like, yeah. well, actually mine is Darth Vader swords in a barrel, uh, which is even yeah. better in my opinion. Um, when you whip out Buckaroo and everyone's just like, what the hell? Um, sometimes you have to kind of call the elephant in the room and just be like, Look, you know you all want to play it. So like, stop, stop being grumpy. But like there is this, this this power of judgment and stuff. I think stops us from exploring these out of out of bounds things like consulting yeah. World of Warcraft. Or playing. And I don't get that very often. Normally, everyone's just either a little bit awkward at first, and, and we have to like get them get them going. But once they get into it, they love it. But sometimes yeah. I have had one or two people just be like, "I'm not playing the fucking Lego. Like, I'm a grown man or yeah. a grown woman or whatever." Yeah, it's kind of similar in that. Do we do we allow ourselves to take inspiration or even not just take inspiration but actually do shit like like we talk about gamification but do we allow ourselves to really gamificate work like do we it, do we actually do it I, I i don't think we do and i reckon there's a lot of fear generally speaking i think there's a lot of fear of wanting to try something new and then it failing yeah. And actually that feel of fear of failure can very much stop progression. It really can. Mm. But I'd also say that there's times that I've done stuff before now that I look back on and I cringe a little bit because of just how, like I say, out there it was, but just maybe how different it was from what people have traditionally experienced. So I'll give you a quick, quick example. Um, years ago, this is, again, coming back out of uni, this had been, what, 20... 14 2015 right and yeah. uh hannah my, my now wife uh was going out to costa rica for three months to do volunteering and as part of that she had to go into various villages and little towns and then kind of support them through things like improving hand washing and improving hygiene and kind of teaching them yeah. how to do it so i said wow okay i mean like how did you do it like what did you do and she said right pete i am um, i got all of the kids in a circle and got a tennis ball out and I covered the tennis ball uh, in Vaseline. Yeah. And then I got another tennis ball out and it was just a normal tennis ball. So firstly, yeah. between it, we literally did an ice break and we throw the tennis ball to each other. And you catch a tennis ball and you say a fact about yourself or like what your name is, something really simple, right? And literally then you sort of pass the tennis ball around and then when it gets back to you, you then say, right, okay, we're now gonna talk about another thing. Just can be any topic, it could be like, what's your favorite food, right? And then the next time you ask a question, you throw the Vaseline covered tennis ball and the first person catches it and they go, oh, and you say, oh, you know, throw it on. So they, you know, reluctantly throw it on. The next person catches it and they go, oh, and then you literally carry on type of stuff. And everyone's kind of at sort of like three or four throws in looking at the hands a bit. And you see the other person's about to get it the fifth time. The fifth person's like, I don't want that tennis ball. I don't know what's on that. It's gross. Right. So, uh, you then get the fourth person to throw you the tennis ball back and you say, right, okay, now what we are going to do is we're going to pass the tennis ball around in a second, but we're going to talk about germs because genuinely the first time you're throwing that tennis ball around, absolutely no issues. But the second time when you could feel the Vaseline on, that's the same as having germs on something that you're passing around. 
And if you're not, for example, washing your hands in between times where you might have picked up something dirty or you might have been handling like raw meat or something like that, you might then inadvertently like literally kind of infect yourself with something. Mm. So then she followed that up with proper hand washing techniques. And I thought, wow, mm. that's really cool. That's really cool. I didn't really do anything with it at the time, but a couple of years later, I was uh, in my first job uh, in health and safety working at Hilton. And we had a, uh, a global safety and security team day. And everyone had the opportunity to kind of pitch an idea. So James, if you imagine you've got a, a room full of global health and safety professionals, including the new vice president of safety and security, who was a former FBI agent. And I didn't realize that he'd just joined the business. So at this point, I was like committed to trying out something, James. I was committed to trying an effective interactive toolbox talk to do with hand washing and a Vaseline covered tennis ball. Right? <laughs> so Please tell me it went well. I literally, I did it, right? And honestly, it was, it, it went down well, but it went down yeah. with probably the most surprise I think I've ever seen from a group full of health and safety professionals, right? Because they literally, in their own words, this is crazy, Pete. We've never seen, we've never done anything like this before. Like, yeah. what, what is this? I said, we, we get it. We think it might be a bit too much kind of for now, but maybe in the future, what? right? Really good. That's so frustrating. Like, honestly, why, why for now? Like, what's the, uh, uh, what's the difference between now and later? Like, I just but, don't get it. No, no, I get you. I get you. But for, for what it's worth, genuinely, at the time, I was like, I've, I've got to do this. Like, I've, I've built up that I'm going to do something in this meeting already. So I'm going to have yeah. to stick with it, right? But the nerves that I felt, oh, my God, James, I, I thought I was going to have a heart attack, right? My palpitations <laughs> literally <laughs> thrown around this Vaseline <laughs> called tennis ball, right? It was as That's great. Know. But then... It, it was quite a good one because I used that exact same process when I did my uh, level three teaching education certificate and then literally built that out into a lesson plan kind of more formally um, a couple of years later when I was doing that level three teaching education one. And it, it literally works really well as a toolbox talk. I've done it a number of times since. Uh, and honestly, I love it because it's different. It's memorable. Like there's that whole thing you only remember what like 10, 20 percent of what you see in a presentation. But I tell you what, 100% of people in that room remembered catching a Vaseline covered tennis ball. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Because it, it shocked them. I think there's some science, and I can't remember what it is or what it's called or, or whatever, but, but both using the hands to do mm. something and learning slash communicating something at the same yeah. time is is like really powerful i can't remember i mm. remember reading it somewhere i can't remember what it was so but that's why i kind of use we use lego a lot so i haven't actually done more than just the the lego ducks for a while but because it's never it's not really come up for probably the last year or so but we have at times used just a big pile of lego to mm. discuss explore a problem so, so do you mind if I put you on the spot for a sec? Because I appreciate you've mentioned about the Lego duck, but what, what do you mean when you're talking about the, the Lego oh, duck? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we've got like, I don't know if I've got one around. Um, no, I haven't. I do. Oh, it's in the car. Oh, oh, no, it's not. It's behind me. Here's one I made earlier. So basically we have, I'm not going to show you how to build the duck because that will spoil it for anyone that does come in the workshop. But essentially we have uh, a little bag of Lego. If you're on YouTube, you can see it. Um, and every bag, so everyone gets a bag of, of the same bricks. So they all have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of Lego. Um, and there'll be a picture of a normal animal duck on the, uh, on the slide, on the screen or whatever. And I will give them all the same bag of Lego and I will give the very vague instruction of build a duck. And that's it. And you'll get a couple of people look at me and they'll go, huh? And I say, it depends. If I'm up north, I'll go, come on, you've got ducks up north. If I'm down south, I'll go, we've got ducks down south, haven't we? Like, I don't know, some shit joke like that. And, um, and, and that's it. And everyone just goes, and I'm like, look, don't overthink it. Just think about a duck and just start building duck. Like, just build. Yeah. Just put bricks on top of bricks. Um, and just start doing it. Um, and you get some really bad 
ducks. <laughs> so you get a lot of really bad ducks. You get some good looks. Um, but but I tend to talk once we get to the end of it, I will talk about um so I'll get anyone to hold up their ducks and I'll, I'll look around the room. Has anyone got the same duck? I've only ever had the same duck in a room once, which is when two people copied each other. Um <laughs> and um and we've I've been doing the ducks thing for like, I don't know, about seven years, I think. Yeah. And I love it you get them told up and you say has anyone got the same duck or a similar duck and no one ever does and and even if they do like that doesn't ruin the exercise it it just makes Mm -hmm. it more interesting but you're like right look around the room everyone's given the same resources the same instruction yet the outcome was different every single time and then the conversation depends how how on time i normally tend to use this just as an icebreaker but if i was to use this to explore it further i would say well how could we fix something like um and then i would say then they go oh we'll give procedures okay cool we could give procedures and for something like this that would probably work really well because it's quite simple um but what we might lose um is people's imagination and and just ability to just build something themselves so we lose like a lot of motivation in that when we look at like h pink's work and stuff like that yeah where people just get the pleasure out of it now what i think lego have done phenomenally well as a product is provide the ability of creativity without being creative. You can build something, you are given every single step that's designed for you, the bricks are made for you, the instructions are given and all you, all you do is follow someone else's instructions, yet at the end of it, you still feel like you've created something amazing. And people yeah. don't go, look at this product I brought from Lego, they go, look at this thing I built. And that's so interesting. Because mm-hmm. when we talk about workplace, we um, or if you look at H. Pink's work, like I'm saying, if we over, if we over proceduralize something, we take away people's autonomy and and stuff like that and their creativity. But yet, yeah, Lego have done exactly that. You have very little autonomy in Lego. Yeah. But if you're building a set, you have little autonomy. You have no autonomy. You do exactly as you're told. Otherwise, it won't work. But yet, you still feel creative. It's phenomenal. Anyway, I went on a little yeah. bit of a tangent there, but we use the Lego ducks for talking about human variation and how we can all do stuff and then like i have as well before had um pre-box like sets of of lego but i've screwed i ripped out some of the instructions or missed out words on the instructions and then gone and said right here's there's some instructions in this one build them except they've all got different instructions and it's all really messy and and stuff so they they still fuck up um so then we go okay well what what's wrong there well the instructions were shit right okay cool so there's there's it's important that we have good instructions then but the set's a little bit more complicated Mm. um so that's just two exercises and then the one that i was going to talk about is i sometimes give them just over there they're too far away but like a bag of just random bricks no instructions no nothing and i might ask them to build their problem or build their frustration or build what they're trying to describe or even just build uh, something that represents safety for me. Like mm-hmm. if I'm saying like, I want you to def- define safety for me. And everyone's like, what do you mean? Like, oh, I'll, I'll tell you what, there's some Lego in, in the middle, just build it. Build safety for me as a group, just build it. And the stuff that they, they build and then they describe is so much more powerful than what you would tend to find in like the generic bullshit. They'd be like, well, yeah. the bridge, the bridge represents this and the fence represents that. And then this person here represents this. And, and you just see it. And, and the difference is just unbelievable. I've got some pictures oh, of a group that. that did it, but it was, it was amazing. Um, Absolutely love when that. we did the safety one. Um, but I use Lego all the time. Like do, do all you know, the time. I, I tell you what, I mean, we, we obviously we're talking about inspiration, right? And where we get inspiration from. But like you said before, inspiration goes hand in hand with imagination. And mm. without wanting to sound a bit like kind of as, as I don't know, as, as deep as a paddling pool for a second here, I've, <laughs> I've got very little imagination at times. I can, you tell me, can I create an abstract network of an interconnected management system for digitization? Oh my God, yeah, literally that comes to mind immediately. <laughs> If you tell me, Pete, how can we use Lego to improve understanding of risk assessment subjectivity? And I'm just like, um, g- g- um, g- let me come back to you. All right, let, let's take yeah. five. See, so, I'm the opposite. I mean, well, if, if you said to me, build a management, I'm like, fuck's sake. Yeah, okay. I'll try. <laughs> I can do it, but like, it won't be as good as like Peter. But if you said to me, use Lego to describe X, Y, I'd be like, I am fucking in here. Let's go. Right. So here's 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 my thing for you, right? As as a safety professional, genuinely, especially earlier on in my career, 
I would have loved like a kit of like five icebreakers where literally like what you've described, here's how we use Lego for this. Literally here is a Lego and here's a step-by-step instruction as how you can use it. Because honestly, I, I kind of struggled when I was, especially when I was starting out, you know, you go to this like, she advised the type of stuff in a site and you get to, all right, Pete, do some training on risk assessment. And I'm just there like, sure, I'll make a PowerPoint, right? Because that's yeah, what you yeah. do. You make yeah. a PowerPoint. What are you going to do is your icebreaker. Uh, I, I don't know, like talk about risk in real life, like crossing the road. Are you doing a risk assessment then? But like, that's, that's fine. But I, I, I genuinely, I wish, James, that I had a kit like what you've described and just some instructions to being like, here's how you do it. Maybe like, I don't know, a video or something that would, because again, as a person that lacks imagination at times, seeing it on a YouTube video that I can just plonk down on a lunch day, uh, lunch break mm. type stuff, that'd be unreal. That would be, yeah. I, honestly, I genuinely think that would have had such a profound impact on how I could have gamified training mm. sessions, toolbox talks, especially early on in my career, help even later on in my career as well. That would have been unreal, like absolutely unreal. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I think as well, like we like so. As a, when you were talking about risk assessments, I, the the other one I've done as well is, is um, I played poker to train people on risk assessments. So oh right, we just, okay. We just played a game of poker, Texas Hold'em. Um, yeah, but yeah. basically, when when you get the flop out, it, you get more information and you make a risk based decision. And then when the river comes out, you get more information and you make a different risk based decision. Uh, it's just a risk assessment um the, the information has changed the risk is win or lose more the risk benefit is win or lose more your money um how do you want to how do you want to make that decision um and and that is a risk assessment so i've used poker as a, yeah, you, know, oh, a you, make, you make that sound so easy right as part yeah. of stuff but i never would have thought about using a card game like poker to have uh to, to have talked about risk but now that you've said it I'm, I'm like that makes it makes so much sense so i would use some there's a game called um some people might have called it a uh, shed or oh shithead if you've played it uh, it's kind of like <laughs> I, I yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so uh what three three blinds three face up and three in your hand and then literally yeah. the idea is you get kind of cycle through all the cards and then kind of play your you're up some play your blinds yeah. type of stuff, uh, different types of magic card, but you can literally go through the same risk based approach as you as you do. That that's it. It's, yeah. it's the same principle. But until you've literally just said about using Texas Hold'em, then I never would have. I never would have thought about. I I literally I never would have thought about using a card game to describe risk. Oh my god, James! Well if, but but you, what you need to think about as well, right? So. When, I, I can't remember who I was talking to on a podcast, but I was talking about a, a, a long time ago when we, we have kind of demonized people who are in safety that are kind of very process compliance driven people, right? Mm. It, it kind of, it's not the sexy thing to do in safety now, like kind of the more, like the stuff I enjoy, like more creativity, more like chaotic, more like, yeah. I mean, I'm not people centered, but all of the, like, human variation and stuff like that that's the sexy stuff right now right but my stuff wasn't sexy when i started in safety but, but what we shouldn't do is is demonize one or the other because mm. like there's a reason why when when you approached me to join the business i was like he is the opposite of me and that's exactly what we need like we had someone who yeah. is like who who just like looks at a fucking board game and is oh my god we could use this like we'll never get anything done like like we, yeah. we need someone that could like you just said i can you ask me to kind of put together a complex management system i could do that i can't do that like so it, it it's like each each one is 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 required in the profession and it's different types of people mm -hmm. um and i'm not kind of it's not as simple as putting them in buckets if that makes sense like, oh, you're a compliance person yeah, yeah. you're a you're a creative person it's not as simple as that, i don't think but like to oversimplify that, that's kind of what i mean but like i think that it's how our brains work it just makes that's what makes us beautiful like i look at a game of monopoly and i'm like well that, i could use that here and i could use that there like if you look yeah. at the monopoly is a great example monopoly is building an empire and then and then deciding what to do with that empire but but the building of it is basically building a business right so if you're trying to build yeah. empathy for the shop floor to have empathy for the, the the senior people of the business, put them in the game of monopoly. 
um, and then put them in a position where they actually start heavy hunt, like they start with the empire already built, and then say, right, now keep playing the game, but don't fucking lose it. And yeah. they, they won't take any risk. Like you see yeah. it, and they'll be like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to do, and it's like, well, that's what your boss feels like. That's what the director of the business feels like, and vice versa. If you wanted to do it, you could use a different game. I don't know. You could yeah. use Monopoly, but start them as with nothing, and then that is like where where the worker feels. They feel like they've got no control, and that that you know, I don't know whether Monopoly would work in that sense. But ultimately, there's yeah. so many things in games that we can use. That's probably why I take a lot of inspiration in my work yeah. is from the not, game. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I, I see a lot of challenges with social media for a second, where we build our networks, we build our feeds based on people that are kind of like-minded toward us. You know, they're not going to say that we all create echo chambers as part of stuff, but algorithms don't necessarily promote diversity of thought. But I'll be honest with you, I can't think of any. I've got like, well, I don't know nearly 4,000 connections on LinkedIn. But I can't think of anyone that's ever put anything up about safety to do with like learning from Monopoly or actually how you can use Texas Hold'em or how you can use Lego. Don't get me wrong, it's all really great stuff like processed bits around like ISOs, about management systems, about digitization, automation, literally about everything to do with topical safety. But James, I've, I cannot think of a single time when I've seen someone actually say, here's how you can apply relatable life experiences to talking about safety. And at the end of the day, Jesus Christ, isn't that what we're all supposed to be doing? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, where's, if honestly, I'll tell you what, if anyone's listening to this and you're like, actually, I know a so-and-so that puts out loads of content about real life experience applied to safety to make relatable conversations, let me know, please, because honestly, yeah. I've I'm talking. We're talking about this now, James. I can't I can't think of a single person. I honestly there is, can't think of a single person. There is like an organisation that does like Lego. So Lego Serious Play. So where I started mm. using Lego is from a notion of Lego Serious Play, which is an actual thing. So it's an actual branch off of Lego. Now I'm not a Lego Serious Play facilitator, primarily because it costs about stupid amount of thousands of pounds to become a lego serious play facilitator and yeah. i'm tight as fuck so i'm not <laughs> gonna do that um but <laughs> but that so that does exist but in the uk it seems to be very lacking and I, I think particularly in the uk not all of us but particularly in the uk i think there's a bit of a stiff upper lip like a bit yeah. of fear of judgment if like i'm gonna like you said if i'm gonna walk in a room of of directors and hand them a vaseline covered tennis ball i'm gonna yeah. get laughed out the room yeah you might you, you might get laughed out of the room but if you do and that's the kind of way you want to work then that's not right for you so the business isn't yeah. right for you so it's better to find out sooner rather than later um, yeah, yeah. i don't know and life's not as simple as that right we've got to pay bills and all, i get that but, but i don't know there's part of me that's like just just do it like if we have more yeah. people in safety that just did shit like because i guarantee there is more people out there Peter, that do have these crazy ideas but they, they, they maybe just don't do them because they're a little so, bit like, well, that's not what everyone else is doing. Like, uh, they're waiting for mean. some academic to write a book or yeah. uh, tell them that it's okay to do it. Like, I'm telling you now, if you've got a crazy idea, just fucking do it. Just do it. Yeah. And it will probably go wrong. And here's a really good example, right? So I got a paid job um, to do a keynote for, um, for a company. And they were like, can you come in and talk about basically a load of boring shit? and i was like right okay you want to talk about fire is one of your topics you want to talk about yeah okay fine what if i set up like a dust explosion um demo and, and i did that in front of everyone and they were like yeah that's cool and, and i was like okay cool so i've got this little tin right i i pretty much nailed it i know exactly how to do this exercise i've done it all the time in the kitchen maggie loves it like yeah. it just i know exactly how to do it I got to site and they were like, oh, I've had a little bit of a slight change of plan, right? We can't do it inside. We have to do it outside, right? But okay, I kind of come prepared for this. I've got like a shield, uh, like a perspex cover in case mm. I don't want anyone to die, basically, hurt themselves and sue me. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. I kind of got it. 
it was the windiest day <laughs> we've ever experienced. I couldn't even get the candle to light. Like it oh, just no. wouldn't. Well, we were at the top of the hill. There was about 60 people standing watching. And I'm just standing yeah. being like, oh, sorry, guys, sorry. And I'm trying to get it. And literally a couple of people went up. Oh, that's literally the only reason I came for this thing, was to watch that dust yeah. explosion. And also, in hindsight, I think the tin was a bit too small for the amount of people there. So it, it fucking went, it went so bad, I offered the customer their money back. Everything else yeah. was fine, but just that bit went so bad, I offered the money back. Um, it was for me, it went so wrong. But yeah. you know, I fucking, you fucking tried it. Do you know what I mean? I had one yeah, wrong, but yeah. I've had twenty go so well. Like, just try it. I actually haven't done the dust exposure one since. <laughs> but right, I will tell you what, I'm, I'm seeing a YouTube it. video on rebranding safety coming up. It honestly, we need to do, we've got to do a series of something like practical safety, and then it's literally yeah. like all of these bits, like the dust explosion one, and how to set it off. And There's stuff. so much to do. I really want calls. to do one where you get a mobile phone, and if you whack it with a hatchet, you that, that well, that's basically a lithium battery fire. Oh. I'll show you how to do it. Do you know it's it's so again it's funny you say that like so genuinely I love torches honestly Danny you know I love yeah. torches James right but this this is an example of an eighteen six fifty battery same batteries that you get in a vape right and I have to use uh, unprotected batteries as part of this so yeah. genuinely if you put the battery as the negative uh, part of the battery down onto the positive terminal close the torch up it will legitimately set on fire. Like it legitimately will set on fire. That is, it, it, you, you have to be so careful with it. Um, it is by design because to do it that way, you end up when you do it normally, you get an insanely powerful torch in a really small, uh, small size. So, where I have kind of experiences of talking about then EV fighters, it's because I've ended up doing so much research in the past about mm. different battery types because of torches because of torches i've literally having conversations right. with insurers about ev battery fires and the risk of uh sort of like thermal runaways and the potential risk of battery fires starting how we can for example like resolve potential fires from uh disposable vapes as well and how we can try and mitigate those risks and the knowledge that i have i'm no expert but i tell you what if it wasn't because of my love of torches i wouldn't have half of the knowledge that i do about it That's so right. genuinely right. so much inspiration can come from so many different places james yeah. and just, just try shit. Blood, like exactly yeah get yeah, genuine take one message away from it try shit i love that just do mm. it what's what the is more the you fuck around the more you find out <laughs> <laughs> just please do a risk assessment first if you are thinking <laughs> about doing that dust explosion thing but like, uh, risk fluent we... takes no responsibility for or liability <laughs> for anyone trying this this is not formal advice you... We've already got that blurb at the beginning of the video now. <laughs> um, so, but interestingly, right, we, we've got a shit, we've got another meeting that me and you need to get to. But like, no, we do. I'll, I'll finish off on one thing. So we designed once in a, in a, um, in a housing association, basically, uh, that we yeah. worked for, a training course that was putting our building managers in a building that's on fire. But it was in a very controlled environment so it was at a fire service training center and it mm -hmm. was you they were watching us we were surrounded by trained firefighters um everyone had ba on and basically we were going to demonstrate why we why we maintain fire doors so how smoke moves around the building how fire moves around yeah. the building why we need to keep our communal areas clear because um for the fire service so we got them to like rescue people but like go through uh, a corridor that basically had shit all over the floor and it was people tripping over and stuff like that. And it was madness, very controlled, right? But if you did see it for the first time, you'd be like, oh my God. Um, but the, the value we got out of that, we saw in that area an instant improvement in fire door management, an instant yeah. improvement in communal space management. They don't do that training course anymore because of health and safety. Why? It got shut down. The, 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 yeah. The, Chiefs in the fire service and the people in the housing association was like, I don't like this. So they shut it down for health and safety. And we were doing it for fire safety, in so facto health and safety. Um, yeah. And it got shut down. It was, it, we risk assessed the shit out of it. Like we were the safety team. Like we weren't just going to put people in there. Um, hmm. It would be a freaking brand nightmare for the business, let alone the safety team. Um, yeah. So it was well managed, uh, in our opinion, particularly if you were to do a risk benefit analysis, like 100%, it was 
it was very well managed shut down for safety like and that's so frustrating because i don't think it was shut down for safety i think it was shut down for a lack of risk appetite for insurance liability more than anything mm. but whatever um and it, it's just like just cry it like it got shut yeah. down I, i've done the fucking dust explosion in front of six people and got embarrassed and drove home for two hours just like fucking feeling like shit but like yeah. there's so many more times that i have tried shit and it's just gone so well like and yeah. it's just and the, and the lego all came out of like there was always a first session where we used the ducks there was always a first session where we used bucks and buckets of lego there was always a first session with jenga with buckaroo with freaking monkeys in a barrel darth vader swords in a barrel whatever it is all of that shit was done once for the first time and i was shitting myself yeah but we use that stuff all the time now and every time we do it someone comes over and goes what a great session like i yeah. just never knew that would that you could have a safety training session like that um but unless you take that risk you, you wouldn't you wouldn't ever get to that point i love that that's advice for so, life your first one's never going to be good but keep trying keep iterating it will get better exactly you it's, will get better there's so many lessons in that we kind of didn't Absolutely. really talk about fiction much but i definitely think no, we, we talked about talk like inspiration for sure i mean i've got a little bit of a call to action for anyone that's listening to this as well if you've enjoyed what you've heard about some of these different activities that we've doing uh, we've done or that we actually still do at the moment and you want to see a series of videos a booklet something on practical safety uh, activities to share safety information or to improve safety let us know because honestly if, if i'm hearing all this stuff james genuinely I think I would have loved to have seen something like this, like in, in my career. I would have loved it because I just wouldn't have thought about doing it myself. I wouldn't have even known where to start. So if, if anyone's listening to this and you're like, I tell you what, I'd love to have seen that too. In fact, I'd still love to see it now. Let us know. Please do. Okay. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll have to keep this one a little bit short. Unfortunately, we got back to about meetings and Pete was late because he was busy having a shower and doing this. <laughs> I actually was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, very true. Can't look this good normally, James. That's it. Right, All right, thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye bye.